Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. Today is Thursday, September 9th and I am going to be working the dinner shift tonight again trying on Uber Eats and DoorDash. My last video posted was my attempt at working on a Tuesday night which I should know better. Tuesday nights across the country are apparently really really bad so I just need to stop trying to go out. So I'm hoping for better success on this Thursday evening. In this video, I do want to take some time and reflect on all the happenings of September 11th, 2001. We are approaching the 20th anniversary of the attacks that happened here in our country. And I believe it's always important to remember those nearly 3,000 lives that were lost and all the heroic acts that took place not only on that day, but in the months and years after. I am a born and raised Chicago native. I lived in Chicago at the time, but I did live in New York for five years from 2015 to 2020. And I always made it a point to go visit the Ground Zero area where the towers stood and pay my respects. I do have plenty of my own photos that I will insert. And in March of 2016, that was the first time that my parents came to visit me. Uh, while I was living in New York and we were able to make the 9-11 Museum a stop on their trip. And I have to say that that museum, I think we spent about three to four hours in that museum. And once we left, I don't think any of us spoke a word for at least two hours. Uh, it was a very sombering experience. I'm very grateful I was able to see that museum and get a truly better understanding of what happened on that day, what the people went through that day, but also hear some survivor tales and hero tales, which were very nice to hear, and just continues to give you hope in humanity. Anytime the anniversary does come up, I do always like to ask those around me, where were you when you found out what happened? Now, I cannot believe again that it was 20 years ago, so I guess I'm assuming if you're the age of 30 or or older, you'll have a memory because you would have been 10 years old at the time. And I myself was 17 at the time, and I was only a couple weeks into my senior year of high school. And I remember that morning and that whole day so vividly. So obviously these attacks happened on the East Coast and I was an hour ahead since I was in the central time zone. So flight 11 flew into the North Tower at 7.46 my time. And during that time I was in orchestra which took place before school started and lasted through first period which was also known as homeroom. So I was, you know, blissfully unaware of what was happening while I was inside of my orchestra class playing music. Flight 175 hit the South Tower at 8.03 my time. I believe around that time that I was headed to my second period class or either waiting for orchestra to wrap up and had no idea what was happening at that time. I will never forget getting into my first regular class of the day, which at that time was English class and one student that I, again, we were, I was a senior in high school, one student I went to elementary school with as well. I'll never forget, he walked in and said, oh my God, did you guys hear a plane flew into the trade tower? And at that point, it didn't mean anything to me. I had never been to New York at that time. I'm not sure I knew what the World Trade Centers were. And it just, you know, this, this guy was kind of a jokester. His name was Michael. I won't say his last name. But I just, I can remember where my seat was, how he walked in and said it to the whole class. And the teacher just said, Mike, sit down. Because I'm not even sure if the teacher knew at this time. I mean, we didn't have our phones at our fingertips like we did, like we do now. But I just remember in the back of my mind during that whole class thinking, I wonder what the Trade Center is and a plane. I'm thinking like a, a model airplane or a very tiny small plane. So I had no idea what, what happened. So it wasn't until I got to my third period class, which at that time was Spanish, 
and I remember the class being interrupted. We were in the middle of a lesson and the announcement went off over the loudspeaker that it was confirmed that at that point the two flights had crashed into each tower, the north and south tower, and also at that time uh, it was confirmed that Flight 97 did crash into the Pentagon. So after that announcement, um, another thing that was so jarring to me is that my Spanish teacher at the time, I had her for my junior year as well. So my entire junior year I had her and never once heard her speak English. All four years that I took Spanish, none of my uh, Spanish teachers ever spoke English to us, except maybe on the first day, I think. But after that announcement, she spoke English to us. And I could tell her voice was shaky. And, you know, I think an adult at that time knew much more what was going on better than a 17-year-old who was kind of ignorant to what the World Trade Center was. And I couldn't imagine the scope. We hadn't seen any footage yet at that point and I could just tell something was wrong. And I think it was right before we were gonna go to lunch, they decided to keep us in school, I remember that. And it was right before our lunch period where they decided to, there was one classroom at the beginning of the hallway and I was currently at the end of the hallway that had an actual TV. And I remember we all crammed in there and we were just watching the news. And I remember seeing um, the city blocks filled with dust, the stills of the planes in the buildings, and I just, I remember for, for a group of, you know, 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds to be in a classroom and you could hear a pin drop, you know, I don't think any of us could process what was happening. The rest of the day is kind of cloudy, and I do remember uh, being very upset a lot of us called our parents when we could. We were in rehearsals for a musical that I was in that had after school uh, rehearsal. And at the time, the director didn't cancel the uh, rehearsal. I remember a lot of kids did end up going home. A lot of the parents came to pick them up. But I called my parents and I don't even think they were home. I left a, a message on the answering machine at home to let them know that I was indeed at rehearsal. I remember we were going over our singing and dancing moves and just it felt so weird that we were going on with I had all these images in my head and no teacher was really talking about it and then I remember going home eating dinner with my family we were very quiet and I had a TV in my bedroom and I just remember laying there watching the news and I started crying because uh, it was just a lot to take in so I'm sharing my story just because I would like to hear your story of where you were. I can't, cannot even imagine anyone who was in Pennsylvania at the time of the crash, near the Pentagon, in New York City, the surrounding areas, what that felt like. You know, I'm sure that they relive that horror every single day. So, you know, this has gone down in history as being one of those things that you remember, you know, like where were you when JFK was murdered, uh, the moon landing, Oklahoma City bombing so just there's these moments in your life where you just remember vividly where you were and what happened the feelings of the day and so on so please share with me where you were what you remember your feelings and how just a seemingly normal day turned into a day that nobody would ever forget the first time I was ever in New York was in 2010 I was actually uh, in New Jersey for work and I did get to go to New York and all I saw was Times Square but I just remember that feeling of how awesome it was uh, to be in New York I would have loved to have visited Ground Zero at that time but the only time that was allowed was to visit Times Square and it wasn't until 2011 where I had another work trip where I, I was actually staying in Manhattan and I remember I was staying at the Empire Hotel which is in the the 60s on the west side, so kind of the upper west side, and I walked from there to ground zero because I just wanted to take in New York, and I was able to find pictures. I have an album on Facebook from my 2011 trip to New York, and I was able to take pictures of the new tower being built. It was only in its, you know, about half done phase in 2011, 
and just to see what Ground Zero looked like, I was able to see the beautiful memorial they did to the firefighters and get some pictures in and I will insert those as well. But while I'm in the car this evening waiting for orders on DoorDash and Uber Eats, there is a story that I want to share about a 9-11 survivor and it happens to be one of the most fascinating, shocking, and unbelievable stories I have ever heard in my life. I've been such a huge fan of YouTube for years and years, and for a while I got really sucked into watching 9-11 documentaries, watching survivor stories, watching raw footage from when it actually happened of, you know, people who were just walking up and down the streets and walking the Brooklyn Bridge and just... It, I mean, I was just fascinated with all things 9-11 for the longest time, and that is how I came across this story. So I want to share just a few quick facts about it, uh, again, in between deliveries. The woman I want to speak about today is named Tanya Head. She claimed to be one of 19 survivors who survived from the floors above the point of impact in the South Tower. She claimed she saw her own assistant decapitated. She claimed that her fiancé, Dave, who worked in the North Tower, passed away during the collapse. She claims that on her way out, she was stopped by a man who was taking his last breaths, who handed her his wedding ring and begged her to give it to his wife that he knew he would not see again. She claimed to be rescued by Wells Crowther, who was a 24-year-old hero, also known as the man in the red bandana. I will link a story about him in the description box. And because of this amazing story of survival, she actually became the president of the World Trade Center's Survivors Network. She was able to get state funding for the Survivors Network. She was also able to get a trauma expert to lead therapy sessions for the survivors and for the families who lost their loved ones. All right guys, before we get into that, I am gonna take my first order on DoorDash. It's 675 going 1.3 miles and the restaurant is just about two blocks up. So here we go. All right, so about a minute later, I made it to the restaurant and uh, this restaurant is a stickler for that pickup by time. So. I took a screenshot, um, it's 5.59, I got here, it says pick up by 6.09. So that means I've got 10 minutes of free time now. Sometimes, I'd say like 50% of the time they have it ready. Any of you guys out there have restaurants that don't give you the order until the pickup time or tell you to go wait, because this, this restaurant too is, they do not let you wait in that restaurant. They make it very clear in all caps here, do not wait in the restaurant. But you know what, now it's 6.01, so I'm gonna walk really slow, two doors down, and see if that uh, order's ready for me. Okay, thank you. Ah, uh, yes, it's for Emily G. Okay. Okay, 6.09 on the dot. They had that order ready for me. And it says, GPS says it's one minute away. I am hoping, I am hoping, there's a hidden tip on here because one of the items ordered is filet mignon. But, you know, I think it's five items and 6.75, could there be a hidden tip? Here we go. All right, guys. I'm happy, it was a hidden tip. So base pay 275, tip $8, total was 10.75, uh, $4 more than what I accepted it for, I will take it. Okay, so back to Tanya Head. So because of her position of the Survivors Network being the president and all, she was appointed to give the first ever guided tour of Ground Zero to the former mayor, Rudy Giuliani, 
to the current governor of the time, George Pataki, and the current mayor of that time, Michael Bloomberg. This woman was able to give the tour to those three gentlemen, and it was broadcast on all the news stations everywhere. Tanya was able to keep this story going for about six years until the New York Times wanted to do a piece commemorating the sixth anniversary of the attacks in 2007. So the Survivors Network really pushed to get Tanya interviewed because of everything she had done for victims, for survivors, for the families, all the funding she got for the Survivors Network, and so on. So, throughout the years, it's been said that there have been a lot of inconsistencies in Tanya's story, but people always gave her the benefit of the doubt, considering that she had been through such trauma that she may have forgotten some things or been a little confused at remembering some of the details. Some things that stuck out, though, were that she told some people she graduated from Harvard. She told some people she graduated from Stanford. She told some people that her fiancé Dave that was lost in the North Tower collapse was just that, her fiancé. She told others that was her husband. In her account of the hero Wells Crowther, who did indeed rescue people and was later found to have lost his life in the stairway with other firemen who were going to rescue people, she said first that she saw him. She saw the men in the red bandana saving others. Then she said he was the one who removed the burning shirt off of her back. Another thing was that Tanya Head claimed to have stayed in the hospital that once the attacks happened, she woke up in a hospital, I think it was five or six days later, and, you know, doesn't have any memory of, you know, leaving the tower to waking up in the hospital. She had severe burns on her arm from the 9-11 attack, supposedly. So it wasn't until the New York Times wanted to get this piece together in 2007 that they started to reach out to Tanya to do some fact-checking and to those around her as well. Well, in doing this fact-checking, it turned out that they couldn't verify any hospital ever having a Tanya head in their rooms for five to six days. They couldn't verify her place of employment, which I forgot to say. She said she worked in the Merrill Lynch offices in the South Tower, which at the time, Merrill Lynch had no offices in either World Trade Tower. A couple people recall her saying that she worked for Morgan Stanley and that her story kept changing from working for Merrill Lynch to Morgan Stanley. They were never able to verify that she was actually engaged to a man named Dave who lost his life in the North Tower. Once they got a hold of a man named Dave, they asked if this Dave in his last name was her fiance. She said yes. Well, Dave's family has never heard of a Tanya before. So it is believed that Tanya picked a random victim of the attacks and claimed that to be her fiance. They were never able to track down the widow who got the ring that was given to Tanya by the man who was losing his life in the towers as she passed him. Remember I said earlier that a man stopped Tanya as she was escaping the building and said, please give this ring to my wife so she can remember me. They can never find any wife who ever had a ring returned to her. Also, they were never able to claim the life of Tanya's assistant, who she claimed lost her life right in front of her by decapitation. So, the New York Times ran this story in mid-September of 2007, and I believe a week later, the World Trade Center Survivors Network voted to have her removed completely, not only from her president position, but completely out of the network. It is said that Tanya Head, and that's not even her real name, was attending school in Barcelona at the time. She is from Spain. That is where she lived, and that is where she was on September 11th, 2001. In fact, it is said that she never even came to the United States until 2003. There are many reports of people in her past, people she did go to college with in Barcelona, claiming that she always had these burns on her arm. She said it was from an automobile accident. She claimed it was from a horse riding accident. So prior to her 
lies. She was also lying previously. I have also seen in some of my research that her brother and father were actually arrested for committing a huge entanglement of fraud. So maybe she learned from them and thought that's how she needed to live her life as well. This story, I will never forget in all of my, the hours I've spent watching 9-11 information, the raw footage, the interviews, the documentaries, I never thought I would come across a story like this and I remember learning about it. It just came up in a suggested thread in YouTube and I clicked on it and I was in absolute shock. There is a book written about it called The Woman Who Wasn't There, which is written by three people who were involved with her during the time of her lies in New York. The documentary goes by the same name called The Woman Who Wasn't There, and I think it's available to watch on YouTube and Amazon and other streaming services, but I really suggest you check this out to just see how this one woman was able to trick pretty much the entire world and, sadly, survivors and the families of all the victims that we lost on 9-11. One of my favorite YouTubers, her name is Kendall Ray. She has almost 3 million subscribers. She does a channel dedicated to true crime, mysteries, disappearances, and things like that. She covered this story as well, and I will link that in the description below. If you just type in Tanya Head in YouTube or into Google, you will find plenty of information to see what exactly this woman did and how she was able to deceive everybody. But I've always loved a little bit of true crime, conspiracies, mysteries, things like that, and I just wanted to share this story with you because it doesn't seem very well known. Even though it's all over social media, that doesn't mean that everybody knows about it. So again, please share with me below, where were you when you heard about 9-11? Do you remember what you were doing, your feelings, your thoughts, your emotions during that time? And have you ever heard about this story about Tanya Head? And anything else you'd like to share down below? 20 years this year since the attack, we will never forget, and my heart is with all those affected by the tragic attacks of 9-11. Time update, it is 6.54, and this is incoming right now, uh, $5.25 for 9.3 miles on DoorDash. That's a negative. And Uber Eats uh, has just been crickets. So it's probably been about a good 35, 40 minutes since my last drop off there. So I don't know how much longer to wait. So this is why I'm kind of killing two birds at one stone here and making some content while I'm in my car waiting, right? I don't ever want to be just literally waiting, sitting in my car doing absolutely nothing. So I want to stay productive. So. I feel better about now a wasted 40 minutes in the car <laughs> since I'm recording some content here for a video, but I've got it on, the sound is on. You can see Uber sitting here at zero dollars and there's my, you can't really see that, the 1075 I earned on DoorDash. I'll give it four more minutes, uh, four more minutes until seven o'clock. And if nothing comes by seven, I'm gonna turn off these apps and call it a night. All right, guys, as you can see, it is seven o'clock on the dot. Still zero on Uber, my 1075 on DoorDash. So with that said, <laughs> I'm gonna be done wasting my time. What is your time threshold? Uh, how long do you go with receiving no orders before you go home? please let me know in the comments down below. And also, so now that schools are back in full swing and work is back in full swing for people, people are returning to the office, I'm gonna try early mornings again because now I've been trying some evenings and having no luck either. So I'm hoping that people will be ordering maybe their coffee and bagels to the office or if they're busy getting their kid ready for school, Maybe they'll have it delivered to their home if they don't have time to make stuff themselves. Who knows, but I'm gonna keep on trying different things here. Early morning has been on pause for me for quite some time. So now I'm going to give it a try again now that we are back in fall. So wish me luck. I wish you guys all the good luck out there. I hope your markets are picking up slowly but surely. 
and that you're making more money than I am. <laughs> if you made it this far in the video, I thank you so much for watching. Please remember to share your memories of 9-11, your thoughts on this Tanya Head story. Have you heard of it before? Can you believe that she had the audacity to trick all of these people for years? And what is your time threshold? How long do you sit in your car before you just got to turn off the apps and call it quits and protect your mental health? All right. So take care, guys, and I will see you on the next one. Thank you for watching. Bye.